Voilà, et, écoutez, bonjour à tous. Hello and welcome. I'd like to thank you all for having come to the foundation this morning. I think that the setting is quite a nice one to kick off a day. So today, this meeting will be started off with a bit of information about the expo itself with the MoMA in Paris. We'll have Suzanne Piaget who will be telling us about what the expo is all about. Then Glenn Lowry, who is the Director General of MoMA, will be telling us about the history of MoMA itself and also of its future, of course. MoMA really is at a turning point of its history right now. Then we'll have Quentin Bajac and Olivier Michelon, who are the curators of the expo. And they'll be telling us about the visit itself and also the scenography. The Louis Vuitton Foundation will be entering its third year. In this autumn, it will have been exactly three years since we launched with this MoMA Expo. Over the course of the three years, we've held 11 Expos. The MoMA Expo will be the 12th abroad and also here in France. We also held 120 events, including concerts, which took place right here on this stage and a total of 3,500,000 visitors who came through the doors since we opened three years ago. This is a great source of pride for us, isn't it, Sophie? We also have a presence outside of these walls. We have four venues abroad as well. And we use these venues to present pieces from our collections. This year, we will have Yon Sheng in Venice, Yan Fudong in Tokyo, Christian Botolsky in Munich, and François Boilet in Beijing. In fact, in Beijing, we just opened a beautiful expo venue with Mr. Richter, and it is shown to be very successful with the Chinese audience. So three years, in some ways, this is a bit of a birthday, an anniversary for us, and we're delighted to be able to celebrate it with our American friends from New York and MoMA. I'd also like to recognize the presence here with us of Glenn Lowry and Quentin Bajac. They came in yesterday to attend this conference, and they will be leaving later today, but they really wanted to be present here with you to tell you all about this being Modern MoMA in Paris event. Now, there is nothing opportunistic about this exposition. We have a real complicity and a shared passion with MoMA. And we are also very artistically committed. MoMA is a private institution funded by patrons we are also a private institution with private patronage. That being said, there's no reason to compare ourselves to what MoMA is, but in terms of artistic commitment, we certainly have shared values. This complicity is something that has shone through during various events, including one exactly 10 years ago in 2007. This was when we held the reopening of the new MoMA after the Aniguchi extension was opened. So in 2007, they were opening the new space with a beautiful and historic look back on Richard Serra, and LVMH was the single patron of that event. And that was something that Bernard Arnault really wanted to go through with. Serra, of course, is an artist that he has a particular affinity for. 
Probably one of the greatest contemporary sculptors, and we, of course, were delighted to be involved with that event. There was also the Isagensken retrospective, which occurred a couple of years after that. And also the homage by Bernard Arnault, I think that was four years ago. Four years ago, Bernard Arnault received, within MoMA itself, the Patron of the Year, the Philanthropist of the Year Award. And by way of comparison, for that award ceremony, we were in the Kelly Hall at MoMA, who was one of Bernardo's favorite artists. And here we are surrounded by the works of Kelly. So a great story of complicity between us. And I would really like to pay homage to Marjorie Krivitz and Glenn Lowry for having always believed in the Foundation's projects. It wasn't something that was self-evident at inception, but as soon as we mentioned the project years ago, we got immediate and unwavering support from Glenn, from Marie-José, from the curators and for all of the trustees. And that's something that we saw when we opened the venue. It was the Keys of a Passion event, you may remember it. It was something that Suzanne organized with her team. And there were major loans of masterpieces from MOBA, MoMA for that event. And for us, it was a true consecration. They were giving us their blessing in some ways, and that was something we were particularly sensitive to. There's also, of course, someone who you cannot mention when you cannot not mention when you mention Momus, of course, the Rockefeller family, in, case, in fact, David Rockefeller just passed away, and as you know, he was a great lover of architecture and came three times to the foundation to visit Frank Gehry's beautiful building and also the halls and the expos that were being held within. The very first time he wanted to visit the building before it was finished, he was already elderly, he he had difficulties getting around, but he had such passion that he wanted to come and he really loved our foundation. And David Rockefeller's oversight of our project was something that was very important to us. Here you have Paul Signac's work, Mr. Senéon which is, of course, one of his masterpieces. And we will be lucky enough to have it in our exposition. I think that one of Mr. Rockefeller's final decisions before he passed away, because this belonged to him, I believe it now belongs to the collection, but this is a very rare loan and it required his personal authorization to get it at the foundation. And I think that uh, there was no question about this loan. Things went through very smoothly and quickly and I'd like to thank him. So, a huge thank you to all of our friends from MoMA, Glenn, Marie-José, all of the curators. And I think that bringing together these 200 works of art, now masterpieces thrown around a lot, but let's call these key pieces of history of art. We've got paintings, design, architecture, photography. So these are key pieces, and of course it is a risk taken by MoMA to send across the Atlantic such pieces. It really shows their trust as well, and this is a project that has been around, at least we mentioned it for the first time, many years ago. It took a long time to come to light, and now here we are. And MoMA is currently reducing the size of its exposition spaces because they're going to be launching a new building project. 
Glenn viendra avec Elizabeth in fact, Diller, Glenn will be coming in with Elizabeth uh, Diller, who is heading up the extension project. They will be coming to this stage on the 11th of October to hold a conference the conference will be presented by Jean-Louis Cohen on architecture because as you know architecture is one of the cornerstones of our foundation and also at MoMA as you will see in the exposition itself so the architectural component will be front and center from the beginning of the exposition so there you go. I'm now going to give the floor to our friends to my left. But before I give the stage, I would like to answer a question. So this is a bit of an aside. This is a question that is put to me very regularly by you in the audience and by other people. The LVMH involvement in artistic patronage. There is also often uh, a number of comments and observations that are sometimes baseless, we don't know. And these kind of observations occur when a patron institution carries out their own project. And the question is, of course, whether this means a dip in engagement in other artistic pursuits. Well, let me disproved that immediately acts speak larger than words so I've got a couple of examples for you here things that were decided by Bernard Arnault Bernard Arnault wants the foundation to be very visible and this has of course been enabled by the maisons within the company within a legal framework that some may find surprising but on our part we are very rigorous in the way we work there are laws there are rules there's a framework we always comply with them we use that framework sometimes this can be a disadvantage sometimes it can be an advantage to the foundation and in this case it is an advantage for the art world and the artists in general patronage of course outside of the foundation is still very much active including for the Picasso Museum exposition which will be taking place at the same time as the MoMA Expo here. It's the Picasso 1932 Expo, and we will be the only patron of that Expo. The Amo de la Reine in the Versailles Palace is being renovated, will be opened in a couple of months, in fact, and we are patrons of that as well. The Versailles Palace will be organizing a, an expo called the Visitors of Versailles, which will be on the 17th and 18th centuries, and Louis Vuitton and LVMH will be patrons of that exposition as well. We also have the Decorative Arts Museum, which has decided to organize an absolutely beautiful retrospective on Christian Dior with Christian Gabé, who is the head of the museum, and LVMH is the patron of that as well. The Aix-en-Provence Festival as well was patroned by LVMH, Nuit Blanche, the Odeon, the Ballet de l'Opéra. Now, I feel that it would be in poor taste to bore you with uh, a list of our patronage actions, but it's important to mention these things because it is you who then echo our message. Even abroad in Rome, the Trevi Fountain and the Spanish Stairs are being renovated, Bulgari, Fendi and LVMH are all funding those. The Braun in Los Angeles will be organizing a Jasper Jones retrospective shortly, and LVMH and Louis Vuitton are patrons of that exposition. 
So as you can see, there's a lot going on. The LVMH Prize, now, you may or may not know, this is a prize which is for young fashion designers, and in fact, the award ceremony is on the stage as well. It's a great way to recognize and thank young creators, and that is an act of patronage in the world of fashion as well. The artistic side of the Secours Populaire charity in France receives the patronage of LVMH as well. And finally, this is lesser known, but the Institut de la Vision, which is an institute which is at the cutting edge of vision scientific research, is currently doing experiments on perception of art and painting by non-seers, blind people, and LVMH is giving its patronage to that as well. Now, I don't know whether this is enough to uh, disprove this idea that we are no longer giving our patronage and partnership to our friends in museums and our friends also in the broader art world. We are still very much engaged and are very passionate about other endeavors. And when you know Bernard Arnault, of course, you know that that is something that's very dear to his heart. Thank you for listening to my segment. Let's move now on to the Being Modern Expo itself, MoMA in Paris. This is a beautiful gift that our American friends have given us. It's a gift to the Parisians, the French people, and Europeans as a whole. And I'd like to give the floor to Suzanne Piaget, who's going to tell you all about it. Hello, and thank you for being here with us. Right off the bat, I would like to warmly welcome Glenn Lowry. He is a friend, and we go way back. And there are many reasons why he's my friend. To most of us, he is the director of the MoMA. And since his appointment in 1995, we have been following the various things that MoMA has been doing. We know his collection, of course, and he's used that collection to take multiple remarkable initiatives through things that have been historically challenging and have been challenging in many other ways as well. Like it or not, he has turned us into MoMA addicts. We cannot do anything but go back to MoMA. He truly impressed me as early as 2000 when he had that PS1 fusion, which was very symptomatic in my opinion. PS1 was in the cutting edge of the New York scene back in the day, and this was part of a strategy that has led him to rethink the museum itself. The question is, how can you be contemporary and also modern? This strategy and this mindfulness was something that was clearly stated from the very beginning through his extension policy. Jean-Paul mentioned the Taniguchi 2006 extension earlier, of course, and I think in MoMA 2019, this is something that we'll see as well through the extension headed by Dilla Scofidio, which is much more than just an extension, in fact. This is a true reorientation, rethinking of expectations at the MoMA regarding society and the world as a whole. So, hello, Glenn. Glenn. Of course, MoMA and Glenn are part of a team 
and that team represents a lot of initiatives, action, and also friendship. This is something that Jean-Paul mentioned. From the very beginning, they stood out thanks to the loans of Léger and Kandinsky pieces. On a personal note, I would like to commend Kurt Vanendo's memory, uh, with whom we had a very tight intellectual complicity and friendship. And to commemorate his memory, we received the donation of the double Elvis by Warhol, which you can see in the expo. I would also like to welcome Quentin Bajac. He was appointed by Glenn Lowry as the curator for MoMA and was a key figure in the entire operation. Along with Olivier Michelon, we've been able to get to know him and we appreciate his presence very much. We've talked a lot during preparatory meetings. Everyone has always been very open, very thoughtful in their contributions, and I also learned a lot from him. So thank you, Quentin. For me, having a MoMA here in Paris today is a, a dream come true. A dream that I would never have expected to come true. It goes back to a policy set up uh, in this house even before our foundation opened, uh, a policy that we set up with Jean-Paul Clavry. We wanted to base our work on great institutions. Of course, there's the Centre Pompidou in Paris. But we selected the uh, Hermitage Museum and the uh, Stuckett uh, Exposition and MoMA. MoMA was and is still the reference for all young modern art and contemporary art historians. And on a personal level, MoMA was a founding experience for me. My first fascinating discovery a trip as an art student was Athens. But the second trip that was made for very different yet complementary reasons was New York. If you want to be modern, if you want it to be modern, to be trendy, you had to go to New York. And I must say that my trip to New York, as for all French people today, meant going to MoMA. Like many other French people today, I came back from New York, from MoMA, completely electrified and blown away. And actually, New York was about to become a very significant scene of a creativity with uh, pop art, minimalism, and uh, conceptual art, land art. All of that entailed new relationships to, between art and mankind and life in general. And I'm sure that this will be the case with the new MoMA. Today, it's a new great adventure uh, for us uh, presenting this institution. It's mythical, especially since we, we were all trained uh, through this institution, uh, through Alfred Barr's canon which is sometimes uh, misinterpreted. And this is how we were able to define what art is, what art is to history is, and what it entailed for the future. 
Today what we're mostly interested in is that it is repositioning itself with new challenges, which is quite remarkable. And you'll see it through uh, the exhibition with um, multiple challenges at various levels, uh, geographical, social, and about identity on a cultural level as well. So today, MoMA has an extraordinary reputation, but it's going back to uh, the original spirit that it had uh, as a pioneering institution working as a lab. This exhibition is to be understood as a uh, the new manifesto of MoMA. The project was designed and carried out by Glenn Lowry. He is very much aware that the MoMA collection is exceptional, has a great reputation, is a bit of a legend, which means that it should be not only international, but uh, truly global. Therefore, it leads to a new kind of openness today. And you'll see it on an architectural level. We're getting closer and closer to creation, to art itself, wherever it is in the world. The exhibition was... Uh, designed by both our institutions through a trusting dialogue. But the selection of the artworks was made by Glenn Lowry and Quentin. All six curatorial departments uh, took part in this process, painting and sculpture, of course, but also design and architecture, media, film, performance, and photography. Quentin being um, in charge of this department at MoMA. We also used uh, the archives of MoMA quite significantly. There's a dual goal to this exhibition. We want to show key artworks, masterpieces, but also key pieces coming from the various departments. The second goal is absolutely fascinating. It will become self-evident when you see the exhibition in, in the uh, catalog. We want to retrace the history of the collection, how it was built. Since, uh, since the beginning, since uh, the 1930s. Quentin Bajac was in charge of the catalog. And the chronology of uh, the acquisitions will be very clear. The exhibition and its organization were designed with Olivier Michelon, who played a very important role and who worked closely with the MoMA teams and our architect, Jean-François Baudin. Our role was to have... Uh, a chronological visit for clarity, but we also wanted to have smooth connections with um, the gallery space designed by Gary using its assets and specificities. You'll have examples of that later. In the end, we have 200 artworks from European painting with Cézanne to the most recent developments in digital arts. I think the result is quite unprecedented. It might be surprising to some of you, 
creating unexpected connections between very well-known artworks, but I'm sure that this will give you a food for thought. It's always interesting to be aware of the porosity of uh, artworks. It will be very clear from the very first room of the visit. So I'm now finished with the um, presentation of the exhibition. I would like to remind you of the fact there will be very side events taking place. Jean-Paul talked about what will happen the day following the opening, a dialogue between the architect and uh, Glenn Lowry. And I also would like to mention a symposium dear to my heart. It will take place at the beginning of January. It will be in line with our founding principle, asking the following questions. Who makes art history? And of course, MoMA is one of uh, the most significant places where art is taking place. So there will be two major events, one chaired by Hans Ulrich Oberst with the directors of uh, great institutions in charge of collections, Centre Pompidou, Tate, LACMA, Hermitage, and the Studio Museum of Harlem. And the second session will be chaired by Elizabeth Lipovici bringing together the most active figures and institutions of our time. I would like to greet all the people who played a necessary role in this project. First of all, let me mention Bernard Arnault, who wanted this exhibition and who supported it from the very beginning, and Jean-Paul Clavry, advisor to the president. Who supported the project as well? And right after Jean-Paul, of course, I would like to pay tribute to Marie Josée Cravis, who played a crucial role in this project. So many people were involved in it. I cannot name all of them, but let me start with New York, the scientific team of MoMA. Quentin Bajac, who played a major role with uh, his uh, colleague, uh, Katerina Stathopoulou, and uh, the person in charge of archives, Michelle Elegant. The different departments of MoMA were involved. Anne Temkin, Martina Stirley, Christoph Cherex, Stuart Cromer, and Rajendra Roy. All of them were involved in selecting the artworks, but also in the drafting of the catalog, which was very important to us. The catalog was designed with the support of a huge team gathered around Shul Kim. And the person in charge here was Raphael Chamac with Annie Perez as a coordinator. Going back to New York, I would like to mention Ramona Bronker Bonaria, who is uh, the uh, deputy director in charge of uh, production, and Lama Hum, who is uh, the director of scenography at MoMA. In Paris, a huge team of the foundation was involved. First of all, Sophie Dolleman, who is the deputy director of the foundation. And the teams uh, who worked with us, Elodie Bertolot in charge of production, Joachim Monegier, audiences, communication, Isabelle Capetche and Jean-François Quemin, and Roya Nasser for press, and administration and finance, Jean-Christian Seguret. Once again, I would like to express my gratitude 
to our architect, Jean-François Baudin. Thank you. Good morning. I must say that it has been such a great pleasure to work with our friends here at the Foundation. I would like to thank Jean-Paul Clavery, who's become a friend of the MoMA Museum, but also a personal friend of mine, Suzanne Paget. She's an amazing colleague. She's helped us. She challenged us but she's always been a friend of our museum and of the project. And Olivier, it was a pleasure to work with you for the past few years on this project. And several times this morning, I was asked, why is France so important for the uh, New York Museum of Modern Art? Well, the answer is because Quentin Bajac is with us. We've always been a French-speaking and Francophile museum from the very beginning. Thank you, Quentin, for everything that you've done for the exhibition. I hope you will allow me to speak English a little bit because I think you've heard all of my French. It will be a bit of Franklish. Uh, because we are in the middle of a large project, as uh, Jean-Paul mentioned, and Suzanne as well, and it is precisely because of this project that we're able to lend so many of our most important works of art that would normally never be allowed to travel uh, at the same time. We'll see if that works. as many of you uh, may know, was founded by three remarkable women, Abby Aldrich Rockefeller, who's in the center of this picture, uh, Mary Quinn Sullivan, and Lily P. Bliss uh, in 1929. And one of the wisest decisions they made was to hire a young uh, art historian, Alfred Barr, who was our founding director, and who's uh, thinking about modern art uh, has largely defined the institution. And what's important to remember about Barr is that he not only wanted to create a museum about modern art, he wanted to create a modern museum, that is, a museum that would be different in kind from pre-existing institutions. One of the first bold moves that he made was to recognize that modern art expressed itself across all of the visual arts, and therefore it would not be a museum limited only to painting or sculpture, prints or drawings, but that it would embrace film and photography, two mediums of uh, the late 19th and early 20th centuries that were inherently modern, but it would also embrace architecture, industrial design, and as time has progressed, video, digital, and any form of expression that is inherently modern or what today we would call contemporary. Two founding ideas of the institution in this diagram, this uh, cover to an important exhibition that took place in 1936, will actually be the, in the archival part of uh, the beautiful exhibition that Quentin and Olivier have put together. But, what, but I'm using it here to illustrate that one of the founding ideas that Barr had was to organize how to think about modern art, to in a sense try to explain it to a general public. Being essentially a man of the early 20th century, uh, he was a positive, positivist in the way he thought, and thus, as this chart shows, uh, he tried to structure the hierarchical relationships that led to what he believed to be the most fundamental achievement of modern art, which was the move towards abstraction. And so much of our collection has sought to explain and articulate the ways in which artists moved in this direction. But Barr's other brilliant idea, in, besides trying to 
provide a way of understanding modern art through a, a series of progressive movements was also to understand that the museum was going to be like a torpedo moving through time, the nose, the ever advancing future, the tail, the ever receding past. And the metaphor that he developed to explain this was that the museum would be metabolic or self-renewing. That it would have a collection, but it would never be the same collection. And I know that in Europe, uh, and maybe even in France, the idea of a collection that wasn't permanent, that is a collection that could change, that could actually uh, evolve, sell some works of art to acquire other works of art, is a radical idea, and indeed it was a radical idea in the United States at the time the museum was founded. But our collection and the shape of our collection is never fixed, just like this torpedo moving through time. Some of the recent acquisitions that have defined us uh, and that I think show how the museum changes, up until about seven or eight years ago, the museum's commitment to Fluxus, that great movement of uh, this late 50s and 60s in particular, and early 70s, was barely evident. We had a very small collection. We recognized that this was a lacunae in our holdings. We sought to remedy this and were able to, through an incredible gift from uh, Gilbert and Lila Silverman, uh, to acquire, I think, Quentin, over 3,000 fluxus objects that suddenly make us one of the largest institutions in the world with holdings of fluxus, and that has transformed the collection. Similarly, the recent gift of Patti Cisneros uh, of over a hundred uh, works from her collection of Latin American art, particularly geometric abstraction, and here you see two of the most beautiful, uh, a Torres Garcia and an Elio Otisica, build upon the museum's early commitment to Latin America. We started collecting Latin American art uh, almost from our founding and had built a very strong collection, but her gift expands that dramatically. And of course, one of the major efforts of the museum is to collect, oops, backwards, is able to collect significant works of contemporary art like um, Kippenberger's crushed metro station, and many others. What this means intellectually, and I hope will become extremely evident in this exhibition, is that the museum has to hold together and make evident the relationships between the earliest works in its collection, like the great uh, Cezanne Bather, which will be here, um, and which is one of the first works of art you encounter when you visit the Museum of Modern Art, but also, new, different kinds of art, like Roman Undock's Measuring a Universe, which is a participatory work of art, and which will also be here. And yet, when you look at these two works of art, you realize they share a common problem. How do we define ourselves in space? What are the ways in which we can articulate form? Cezanne through paint, and of course, what we now understand not through the observation of nature, but based on a photograph that was in his studio, undock through the expression of what we as individuals actually look like when we're measured against each other on a wall. And it is this tension between the immediate past and the future that is at the center of the Museum of Modern Arts efforts to remain what Barr thought of as a laboratory to which the public is invited. That is, we're about experiments and ideas, not about uh, answers. And I hope this exhibition, Etre Moderne, will make clear that what is fundamental to the museum is its commitment to the artists uh, and practices that define modern art, but in an open-ended way of inquiry. The idea of the museum as metabolic or self-renewing expresses itself not only in its architecture, not only in its art, but also in its architecture. So if you think about the fact that in 1929 when we were founded, we were founded actually in rented office spaces in the building to the left in this image. Uh, two year, three years later, we moved to a brownstone that we leased on 53rd Street. 
1932. 1936, we demolished the brownstone to build our first home uh, designed by the architects Goodwin and Stone. And what's so fascinating about this image, as you can see, we don't declare ourselves as a museum of modern art on the street. We declare it on our roof because we wanted to be part of this extraordinary urban energy that was building in New York. And the other thing that's dramatic and interesting about this is that instead of a museum that was uh, entered through a flight of steps as if you were ascending to art, you actually enter the museum directly from the street because Barr believed fundamentally that modern art was an art that everyone could enjoy. It was part of your life, part of the quotidian experience. And thus the differences between high art and low art were collapsed for him. Uh, by 1964, we had added an addition to the right of um, the Goodwin and Stone building. We'd also, uh, in the 1950s, built a garden in our back that many of you may have visited. In the, 19, oops, sorry, in the 1980s, we built a tower, which you see in the center of this picture, with galleries inside of that. In the 1990s, uh, we started thinking about and ultimately realized the Taniguchi project, which is what we look like today, as Jean-Paul mentioned. And now we're embarked on another project which also links us to France because in addition to the Diller Scafidio Renfro um, work, uh, we will have six floors of space in a tower that's under construction designed by Jean Nouvel. So uh, the, the Frenchness of the Museum of Modern Art is vraiment dans notre sang. This project will be finished in 2019. It actually is quite complicated and I'll try and give you a sense of its scope it has three goals, to expand and enhance our galleries, to create more space to show our collection in new and different ways. Uh, and actually our expansion will produce about 30% more space. We'll go from about uh, 12,000 meters of gallery space to about 17,000 meters of gallery space, and the vast majority of that will be for the display of our collection as opposed to new galleries for temporary exhibitions. We also want to create a more welcoming and inviting and engaging space uh, for our visitors to be, a, a more, to be even more um, generous in the way we display our collection, but also in the way we welcome people into the museum. So there's a great deal of renovation in some of our public spaces, more lounges, and you'll see that in a moment, uh, a more, more gracious entrance, and so on. And finally, we want to keep building on the idea of the museum being connected to the urban fabric of New York. And this little video um, will give you a sense of what that means. So what you're seeing here on the, in the yellow is the new construction, but we are also involved in an extensive amount of renovation, and we're going to zoom into that right now. So we're going to extend our Bauhaus stair from the second floor back to the ground floor as it was in the 1930s. In addition to that, we're going to create a new lounge to the north of that, You'll see that appear in a moment. It's much easier to do this in a video than in construction. Uh, there it is. And then we're going to remove a wall so when you're sitting in that lounge, you can look out into the garden. And all you have to do is press a button and it disappears. Then we're going to completely reconfigure our entrance sequence. This is like open heart surgery because we're going to stay open to the public throughout this process as we are moving walls, demolishing floors in order to move our um, store down a level below grade so that we can create a larger and more gracious entrance that will allow our visitors to move to the west to access our new building. These are the new galleries that Diller Scafidio are designing for us to our immediate west, and then a new set of stairs and elevators to service that. It's a little bit complicated, but I hope the video explains this well. So here we have the movement paths. 
we are going to completely rethink our foyer. We're going to double the headspace in the foyer. A, a new canopy that reaches out to the street. Aussi, il y a des aménagements. Voilà les, les, les routes de circulation. And these are the elevators and pathways which will enable people to move very easily around the building. Here we have the changes on the third floor. We have reworked all of the expo rooms. We've got three smaller rooms turning into two larger ones. Then we have the new halls in the Jean Nouvel building, which is another extra 1,000 square meters per floor. And then we have the Scofidio building, which will also have exposition halls on each floor and a small restoration area at the top. what a typical floor plate will look like uh, once the project is finished. And so the idea behind this is that when we're through, we will have touched about 50% of the existing museum while adding 30% more space. And voilà notre façade après le grand projet. And here we have our new façade, which will be as is in 2019. And the, this expo here today is the beginning of the renovation works in some ways. So you'll still have plenty of light and see it. The new stair uh, immediately to its left. Uh, and in the Diller Scafidio Renfro building, which is a central building here next to the diagrid of Jean Nouvel, there's a gallery on the ground floor, second floor then a double height space with a fourth floor studio, which is a performance space that will be integral to the way you experience the collection, and then lounges above. And I'll show you what that looks like here in a moment. So part of the project is already finished. In the spring, we opened the renovations to the 1939 building, which saw the Bauhaus stair extended down to the ground floor. I hope you'll have a chance to come and visit and see it. Uh, it's absolutely beautiful uh, evocation of what was there before. The new lounge that's on the ground floor looking out to the garden. Uh, the new bookstore and lounge on the second floor. For those of you who, who know the museum, one of the big criticisms was there was no place to sit and relax because we were so pressed for space. And now every floor has a lounge or a cafe overlooking uh, the garden. Here, the newly renovated galleries on the third floor uh, with our inaugural exhibition on Frank Lloyd Wright at 150, Le Grand Architect Américain, avec ses archives qu'on a acquis il y a... And we acquired his archives five or six years ago, and we're sharing these with the University of Columbia. The double height space when you come into that entrance, uh, with a new ticketing area behind that, the new galleries on the ground floor that have both a double height space and a single height space and will never look like this because we'll probably have a wall between the lower level, the lower height space and the double height space. The new galleries on the second floor that are part of our suite de l'art contemporain uh, avec uh, des, des, des vues sur un petit pas. And we have beautiful views from these. The fourth floor that is a double height black box space for performance and then the galleries in the Nouvelle Tower that is totally woven in and integrated into the project uh, and each of the floors is exactly the same height as the existing floor so that as you move through the building the sequences are not disrupted by the change from one building to the other. So to come back to Barr's diagram uh, what's interesting about the Museum of Modern Art of Quentin Bajac and his uh, coéquipiers, the other chief curators, is that it's a different museum than Alfred Barr's museum. And I think the fundamental difference that Quentin and his colleagues have brought to thinking about the museum is to think about it not so much in an analog way, and here I use analog 
in its scientific sense, or even in its hierarchical organization, either of media or of artistic significance, but to think about it as a network in a digital sense, as about connections and interdisciplinarity. And what's fascinating is several years ago we did an exhibition that we called Inventing Abstraction, where we revisited Barr's questions about 1930, from 1936 about the relationship between cubism and abstract art, and asked ourselves, how was, ab how was abstraction invented? And instead of coming up with a diagram that I would call vector, that is hierarchical, this led to that, which led to this, we imagined it as a series of networked relationships. What are the connections between all of the artists who were engaged at one moment or another with inventing abstraction? And for me, this diagram becomes a metaphor for the network museum, the idea of interconnectivity, that how do all of the different artists and media that we're interested in connect to each other in an ongoing sequence of relationships. And this is already evident in some of the exhibitions we've done. Here's an exhibition called Making Space uh, that looks at women and abstraction in the 1950s and 60s that unites works of art from virtually every department, from design, film, media, architecture, painting and sculpture that puts them in play in new and different ways. And I think when I look at this, I begin to understand how Quentin and his colleagues are building on the fundamental base of the institution, which is to be a laboratory, a place of experimentation, a place that valorizes new and different ways of thinking but at the same time, to imagine a different institution. And the gift, c'est vraiment un cadeau, the gift that the Fondation LVMH nous a donné, c'était de travailler dans ce was to work, was to enable us to work in this Frank Gehry building, which inspires us. It's so interesting, it enables us to rediscover our collection in a new way. And you'll see this in just a few minutes with Quentin and Olivier. I'd like to thank you, everyone here, and also, of course, Jean-Paul, Suzanne, Olivier, and all of our friends here. Thank you. Bonjour. Um... Hello. Now, Suzanne has already laid out some of the major principles of the exposition. Glenn then came back over the past, present, and future of MoMA. That's great. It means I don't have to do it. So Olivier and myself would now like to invite you on a virtual visit of the exposition. So this is a quick virtual visit. And we'll be using a couple of illustrations to help us along the way. We're going to be showing you the visit itself which will be present on all four levels of the foundation. And we'll start off poolside with the first hall called MoMA 1929-1939. The idea behind this hall is based on two main ideas. Pluridisciplinarity, which is, of course, one of the lifebloods of MoMA. Now, it's something that may seem self-evident nowadays, but was a revolutionary idea back in the day. And, in fact, many institutions were very slow on the uptake of this idea, and it took Paris until the 1970s with the Centre Pompidou. So, pluridisciplinarity, which was developed through the early sculptures and paintings. We wanted the visitors to see the bather by Paul Cézanne from the very beginning. It's on the fifth floor currently, and we want it to be accompanied by some of the flagship works for this collection, 
including the Lily Peblis collection, which we got Paul Cézanne, the Paul Cézanne work from. This is a polyphonic work, and by that we mean that it was brought together by multiple generations of curators and also collectors. And I think we really want to underline the, the American philanthropic tradition through the Hopper and the Baracuzzi that were donated by the same person, Stephen Clark, who was a key player in the early stages of MoMA's development and is a trustee. So pluridisciplinarity, which brings together painting, sculpture, and of course photography and design objects. Here we have this beautiful bearing joint, which is part of the Machine Art 1934 collection, and we also have cinema. Suzanne said that the visit will contain a number of surprises. We've got some iconic pieces and also some pieces that are less recognizable to the visitors. The film that visitors will see during the beginning is very important, and it's an example of this. This was donated by the MoMA studio in the 1930s and has only recently been rediscovered. This is the first film that we know of that has an entirely black cast. This is the Lime Kiln Club. It was never shown in cinemas, but is one of the surprises you'll see within the collection. Seeing as we're talking about the international component, of course, international in the 1930s means mainly Europe and the US, in painting and in sculpture, Europe and France was a head of the US, but in other fields such as design, architecture, photography, and cinema, we have some cutting-edge American artist. Continuing on now with what we have called the origins of modernity, we have some iconic paintings by two or even three generations of modernist artists. Things started with the post-impressionists, in fact, with this Paul Signac. So post-impressionist, cubist, futurist, with this beautiful Clint, for example, example that has not been back to Paris since the joyous apocalypse in 1926 in the Pompidou Center and of course the Melovich and Mondrian abstract works. We don't have Calder, Chirico, Duchamp and others here. Uh, Duchamp is in fact here, sorry, with the, his surrealist works. Many of these works were shown in multiple 1930s expos, cubism and abstract art in MoMA in 1936. For example, we've got fantastic art and surrealism in 1936 and 37, and through great monographies because it is through monographies that MoMA is able during this period to show just how it works with living artists such as Picasso and Matisse in 1938. To conclude this part on modern artists, there's a small room with a more um, political aspect to it at the end of the uh, 1920s and the 30s. Uh, when a totalitarist regimes uh, were rising, MoMA was affected as well. There's the uh, Roosevelt speech saying that the uh, MoMA was a fortress. And there was also the exhibition called A Free German Art with the uh, the triptych by Beckman, who is now part of the collection. Uh, it was part of uh, the so-called degenerate art, as the uh, Nazis said. It celebrates and bring, and the other art as uh, work celebrates and uh, brings support to the Republican cause in uh, Spain. At the end of the visit, there is the emergence of American art, which will become a predominant. American art in general, but also abstract expressionism, strongly represented on the East Coast, and more specifically in New York, with iconic paintings of the collection. We wanted to show that MoMA 
has always supported abstract expressionism and American art in general because uh, people used to say that uh, MoMA was not interested in American art at the beginning, but it's wrong. It definitely had an interest in uh, American art. So here you can see two paintings. De Kooning, woman, 1, and Rothko, which joined the collection in 1950. This uh, led to uh, heated debate because it means that one of our trustees uh, quit after uh, this debate. Glenn talked about uh, the archives. So we tried to retrace two different uh, stories, two narratives, the history of art and the history of uh, MoMA. So at the pool level, you will find uh, the story of our archives uh, with about 100 documents, which are very diversified. The archives of MoMA are absolutely wonderful. So many things you can find in them, and many different objects will be represented. For example, this uh, paper tie by Picasso sent to Alfred Barr in the uh, 1950s, and this um, book at uh, the very beginning of uh, MoMA history. The torpedo and other very unique objects that are not necessarily directly linked to MoMA. For example, this uh, Oscar given to uh, the MoMA in the 1970s, this a miniature version of uh, the museum a movie. Uh, homage to New York, which, took, uh, which, was, which was screened in the in 1960, and uh, various catalogs, for example, the catalog for the exhibition, The Machine, as seen at the end of the Mechanical Age, a beautiful piece by um, Pontus Halton, and he worked at MoMA. It was a great experience for him, and as you know, he was the first director of the Centre Pompidou, and of course, he had this uh, interdisciplinarity of MoMA in mind when, uh, at the beginning of his career, at the Centre Pompidou. And then we followed this uh, chronological visit with two sections around series, repetitions, anonymity, trying to a step back from uh, what uh, we uh, mentioned before, a geometrical abstraction, with, uh, first of all, pictural pieces, uh, Kelly, Clark, Carl Andre, Frank Stella, with a pre-minimalist approach. So here we have artists working with the geometrical structures, grids, using metaphors from the architectural and construction world. And this is why we wanted to show them next to other works focused on grids and uh, canvas and uh, geometrical structures. And this fragment of uh, the uh, UN headquarters uh, facade. It was built uh, in uh, the 1950s. One of the fragments was uh, renovated by MoMA and will be presented in this exhibition. On the other side of the wall, but in the same spell, series and repetition, now we've reached the 1950s. 60s with um, pop art. Et notamment une, le pop art qui est représenté massivement par, par Warhol. Uh, of course, massively represented by Warhol. Susan talked about the double Elvis, but of course the soup cans as well, which you can see on the screen. Screen tests by Warhol. Uh, this Jasper Johns uh, piece as well. All about series and repetition, and of course other iconic pieces uh, by Liechtenstein, 
among others, and we wanted to show pieces referring to popular vernacular American culture, so objects that are not pop items in themselves, but could be interpreted as such. For example, this collage by uh, Romare Bearden which was acquired in the 1970s, or uh, Diane Arbus, uh, the famous photographer. Going to level one, let's continue with uh, the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. The ground floor was all about assertion. Now we've, we're reaching a new level of uh, questions and doubts. Two different parts, action. It's all about the questions of the avant-garde, uh, the status of uh, artists in society. Some of the pieces, uh, Flux's pieces, uh, were uh, acquired uh, recently. Glenn talked about the Silverman collection. There's also the Dalek collection, who's a Belgian collector of conceptual art. And so this section called Action could have been called like the uh, Robert uh, Smithson uh, drawing, uh, the Museum of the Void. So we're talking about the dematerialization of art, uh, for example, with uh, Nam Jom Peck. Films are represented by a square of light, and there's also this sculpture by Kravinsky. But more specific questions of the 70s, 80s, uh, especially in, uh, in the American context with the Vietnam War and the cultural wars, a certain number of artists, as you can see, were influenced uh, by the media and uh, very critical of them. The piece by Jeff Wall and the um, poster of Barbara Kruger. So these artists are very critical of the media, raising questions about gender, about the status of uh, the work of art, racial issues as well. Jeff Wall, the Invisible Man, based on uh, Ralph Ellison's famous book. There's also David Hammonds with uh, his African-American flag and questions about a political um, about politics in uh, the U.S. and uh, the context of the uh, early 2000. Still about the, the picture generation in Gallery 7, which is a, a sort of small chapel. We've got all of the stills by Cindy Sherman. Major acquisition by the Department of Photography. So we've got all 70 stills, a beautiful work by Cindy Sherman on female stereotypes, especially in movies. Now, last level, last floor, more specifically dedicated to more recent works in the years 2000, we wanted to have something um, pluridisciplinary. Uh, we wanted to see the, the MoMA collection like a living body, something that is self-regenerating, like a torpedo. So we wanted more recent art, contemporary art, to be represented as well. Some of these artworks uh, were were made in even in 2015 or 16, and they're included in our collection. So now again, two different parts that are complementary. The coexistence of a digital culture and analog culture. With uh, 
different uh, techniques, architecture, design. We wanted very different objects uh, to be represented from uh, the different departments. We know that architecture and design has uh, a lot of uh, architectural uh, pieces, but also video games. And actually, when the first video game uh, came into the collection in a few years ago, it was uh, very controversial. I remember it well because it was when I uh, joined MoMA. So here you can see uh, emoji, emoji that we use uh, all the time on our smartphones today. And one of the big surprises of the uh, exhibition is this newsstand, a very special newsstand. It was um, made by a collective of artists in New York. When you were a young artist, you could uh, drop your own fans in. And this newsstand was presented at MoMA. We are renovating it for, we are recreating it for the second time in Paris. It will bring a slice of the young um, magazine culture uh, that existed at the beginning of the year 2000 in New York. More contemporary artists, uh, some of them are less well known than in the United States, uh, Mark Bradford and Trisha Donnelly, who are the, uh, the, uh, representing the older generation. And we wanted to finish with a younger artist, uh, Latoya Ruby Frazier, Park MacArthur, MacArthur and Cameron Rowland, that were born in the 1980s, MoMA is interested in young artists who are in their 30s, for example. And Glenn also talked about the fact that this exhibition would have been very different if it had been in MoMA. We really wanted to use the building and the specificity of the building by Frank Gehry. On the second floor, we've got three very special galleries, and we wanted to, to have a three very significant artworks. Roman Ondak, Measuring the Universe, it's a collaborative artwork. The um, visitors uh, can um, measure how tall they are. And there's also this uh, work by Yan Cheng with images, uh, virtual images made by video game software, self-regenerating. It's an infinite work of art will never stop. And finally, in Gallery 10, a large gallery with a very high ceiling. It's uh, like a cathedral. So the cathedral of Eugenic Cardiff. This time, it's all about acoustics and sound it's a uh, motet that was uh, dismantled and rebuilt. End of the visit, not quite, because in this beautiful building, there are what uh, Susan calls uh, interstitial areas. And in these areas, we wanted to show major pieces that are very big, so Sol Lewitt. Grand floor will be shown echoing the uh, geometrical abstraction uh, artworks. And on the first floor, this great wallpaper made by the collective General Idea in the 1980s, revisiting the love by Robert Indiana, but changing it in a, a tragic way into AIDS uh, to raise awareness about AIDS. And this recent piece by Louis Lawler, we showed it very recently at MoMA. It's called Adjusted to Fit. Louise Lawler uses some of her older uh, pieces and to readjust them uh, on a wall. 
The exhibition comes uh, with a publication, of course. Susan already mentioned it. So there are uh, articles by Suzanne, Glenn, talking about the past and the future of MoMA. Olivier also has a very interesting international perspective on the museum. Uh, I wrote the introduction. Um, and 51 of my colleagues worked on different texts on the 200 pieces. They're very detailed, giving you a lot of information on how the collection was built. And I think that this publication is actually the first based on the history of the collection based on the various items. And of course, there is an album for the exhibition following and the structure of uh, the exhibition and the catalog. Olivier, the floor is yours. Before our Q&A session, I just wanted to let you know that as Glenn, Jean-Paul, Quentin, and Susan said, of course, uh, the, the building has an influence on the exhibition, um, creating connections or breaks uh, between artworks. So the higher you get, the more monographies you have, so there is a, a true constellation being established. And there are so many works that we couldn't show to you today, but there will be surprises, including the first uh, Mickey Mouse in 1920. Anyway, there's the uh, 1959 Frank Stella, bought in 1959 by MoMA, etc. So the visit will unfold in this way. And the goal was to have a linear, very understandable visit, but also getting more complex throughout uh, the visit. All right, now I think it's uh, time for our Q&A session. I hope that there will be many questions. <laughs> no question for Glenn? Bonjour, Natasha Volinsky pour l'Express Steel. C'est une question so très matérielle, je dirais, mais vous, à un moment, je ne sais plus, un, uh, un site a évoqué la difficulté d'assimiler uh, autant d'œuvres depuis l'outre-Atlantique d'un point de vue matériel. Bon, ça s'est passé uh, dans le monde de toutes ces œuvres. Ça a été en une seule fois. Was it all in one go? Was it staggered? Well, I think that any expo has its complexities when international collections are involved. As you, I'm sure you can imagine, we don't put all our eggs in one basket, so there were multiple means of transport and many logistical things. It was a three or four year process. That's how long it takes to set up this kind of project. And as Suzanne said, there's a whole team, there's a whole team working at MoMA, there's a whole team working here at the foundation. We're relatively used to transporting works of art because MoMA has a history of loaning pieces that goes a long time back. I'd say this is pretty much business as usual for organizers of big expos, although I'm sure there are people there that would say this went above and beyond uh, just day-to-day uh, -day business and this really was a colossal effort. We're pretty used to it. I'm not going to say that we've got it all down, but we're getting used to it. Just to follow up on the previous question, this is the largest loan that... MoMA has organized in its history, or not? 
Oh, absolutely. This is a unique occurrence. It's the first time you've loaned so many pieces. We have worked on other expositions that weren't necessarily of quite this size. During our recent extension in 2004, we did loan pieces to Berlin. But this this particular exposition is without equal, especially at Paris. Of course, some of these pieces have been presented. There was an expo on 1950s American painting. We had the 300 Years of American Art Expo. It was organized by MoMA, but those date a little bit. Peter Galassi held a, an American photography expo in the Centre Pompidou, but uh, nothing of quite this size has been done. And with so many different types, you need to know that without this extension, it would have been impossible for us to loan six tons of artwork because we use them at home and our own audience would be pretty angry if they weren't there and there wasn't the excuse of the extension. Uh, another question for you. Can it be the first step of uh, new collaborations with um, Fondation Louis Vuitton? Uh, that, that is, est-ce que cette première expo cette exposition peut être le début d'autres projets d'exposition commune ensemble? Par rapport à moi, j'espère. Well, I certainly hope so. It was a great pleasure for us to work with our colleagues here. As I said before, Suzanne is someone that I hold in very high esteem and I have for many years, and we learned a lot working together. And we also have Jean-Paul, who's something of a, a guardian angel for us. As he said, the foundation helped us, has helped us in the past, just as the foundation helped other institutions in the past as well, and continues to do. And I certainly hope that we will find other expositions in the future to work on together. Uh, oui, votre question, elle est, uh, uh, voilà, le, cette exposition, c'est une étape. Yes, as you said, this exposition is a step in a process. It's not the end of a story in any way. It's certainly a great conclusion, a temporary conclusion. And the exposition is almost a museum in and of itself. You could very easily imagine a permanent museum based around this collection for this exposition. That just goes to show just how highly committed MoMA is to this exposition and to the foundation. This project, however, wasn't just plucked out of thin air. It was born of working together through shared passions and also shared values and shared commitments to our audience. Of course, there is a past, a present, and there will be a future, of course. As to what that future will be, we'll have to see. But uh, of course, there will be one. There are great projects in the world that we can't do without MoMA's help, and I hope that the Foundation will also be a key element in other future projects. In 10 years, MoMA will be celebrating its 100th anniversary, so, obviously, we're not comparing, but we are certainly active and willing partners. I have a question. My name is Valérie Bougou for the Connaissance des Arts magazine. For most of the French audience, the great piece in the MoMA is the Demoiselles d'Avignon. They're not being brought over this time. Why? Vous avez compris les... Oui. As it, it kind of ties into my colleague's question about uh, transport, was it because it's too valuable? Why aren't they being brought, why are they being brought over, or does it have to stay in New York? The Demoiselle d'Avignon is a piece that our trustees 
decided not to transport, and they decided that about 20 years ago. Of course, when you transport something, it is risky, and our trustees, 20 or even 30 years ago, because it was decided before I came in, so more than 22 years ago, that this peace will never travel again. Unfortunately, because we would love to loan it, Almost every museum has that kind of exceptional piece that uh, that they just can't allow to be loaned even if they wanted to. Are there other pieces at MoMA other than the Demoiselle d'Avignon that aren't allowed to travel? I'd say there's a small number, and it really is our trustees that decide. Our curators are very generous people. They want to share. We love sharing with our colleagues around the world. But it is up to our trustees to decide that there are a few number of pieces that are so important to the museum that they can't allow out of their sight. Sometimes this can be due to the condition of the piece, it's too fragile to be transported, or maybe that the risk of loss is just so great. And there are some other pieces like this that uh, we'd like to learn, but we simply can't. And we need to keep reasons for you to come see us in New York. Okay, if that is the end of the questions, I'd like to thank you for your patience and for your attendance, and we will see you in one month's time.